If you think Charles and Camilla or Meghan and Harry have it rough, we should talk about 17th century royal scandals. Welcome to Chit Chat History and get ready to hear one of the weirdest tales of royal gossip. Today we are discussing the warming pan baby, a baby that was smuggled into the royal bedchamber in a warming pan. Or was it? To set us up, we have some background history before we get into the juice of this story. We have to discuss Britain's religious status. I'll sum it up as briefly as I can, and if you want more in-depth information, there are many more videos on this topic. Basically, England had some struggles back and forth with the Catholics being in power, and then the Protestants, and then a lot of back and forth for many centuries. Eventually, as we come to the 1680s, Protestants were in the majority, but feared that many of the Catholic pots to establish a Catholic rule once more. This came to a head when Charles II died, and his brother James II took the throne. James was Roman Catholic, and the Protestant majority of England did not want him in charge. No one was concerned, however, as James only had two children, Mary and Anne, with his first wife, Anne Hyde, both of whom were raised Protestants. Mary was his heir presumptive, and she was quite popular with the people. That is until James's new wife gave birth to a son. James Francis Edward entered the world on June 10th, 1688, but his birth was controversial. It was his very existence as a Catholic heir to the throne that concerned many people, and therefore rumours spread that he was not who he claimed to be. These rumours started from the very conception of the child. James was married to his second wife, Mary of Modena, who was also a Catholic. Mary had several miscarriages, and those children who survived pregnancy died in infancy, so everyone thought she was really too old to have any healthy children. When it was announced that the Queen was pregnant in December of 1687, there were instantly rumours that this wasn't true. James's two daughters, Mary and Anne, wrote to each other discussing these rumours. We still have many of these letters in the royal collection, and it is quite interesting to see how serious this plot was taken. Anne claimed in March that she now had much reason to believe it is a false belly. Her reasoning... She was never allowed to touch the belly, nor did she see anyone else be invited to do so. And when the wife was changing, she always did so in another room, away from prying eyes. Anne also noticed that the Queen looked far too good to be so far along in her real pregnancy. There have been numerous accounts to actually discredit what Anne was writing here, but she was all but convinced already. Anne wrote that she had so much just cause for suspicion that I believe when she is brought to bed, nobody will be convinced it is her child, except it prove a daughter. For my part, I declare I shall not, except I see the child and her parted. So, basically, she wanted to be the one right there watching this happen, seeing for herself a baby being born, and only then would it prove that the baby was real. Anne, however, was not there for the birth of the child. She had actually taken a trip to Bath the month prior to the due date. She wrote her father that her trip would be cut short, returning home early within the next few days, but the baby couldn't wait. Or perhaps the Queen saw her chance. Anne was not able to make it home in time to see the birth with her own eyes. She writes again to Mary, my dear sister, can't imagine the concern and vexation I have been in, that I should be so unfortunate to be out of town when the Queen was brought to bed, for I shall never now be satisfied whether the child be true or false. That which to me seems the plainest thing in the world is the Queen being brought to bed two days after she heard of my coming to town, and saying that the child was come at the full time, when everyone known, by her own reckoning, that she should have gone a month longer. Mary may have had her own doubts, but she trusted Anne's concerns, echoing the public rumours. Upon the birth of the baby boy in June 1688, a new scandal emerged. It was claimed that the baby boy was smuggled into the birthing chamber via a warming pan. For many Protestants watching on, a Catholic heir to bump Mary out was unimaginable, 
and they would rather believe that the baby had died or didn't even exist than the reality of a new Catholic family line as rulers. The details of this scandal spread like wildfire. It became known as the warming pan plot, as the baby was said to be smuggled into the Queen's bedchamber via a warming pan. This was one of those, uh, what looks like a frying pan with a really long handle, and it was typically used to put hot coals in and then placed within the bed sheets in order to heat them up. Just slightly big enough for a very small child to be carried in. Now there were plenty of witnesses to this birth. In fact, it was noted by the council chamber notes that the Queen's bedchamber was filled with curious spectators. And the King remarked that, by particular providence, scarce any prince was ever born where there were so many persons present. Now, this was common at the time to have witnesses at the birth of a royal baby, but here the court seems to defending outright so many people were there that it must have been the real deal. The public, however, denied all confirmation of the baby's legitimacy, because most of the witnesses present were Catholic, and of course they would support the birth of this Catholic heir. And those in the room who were not Catholic, well, weirdly they all agreed that they happened to have turned their backs during the birth to provide dignity and privacy for the Queen, and they'd missed the actual birth so they couldn't really confirm or deny the plot. If anything, these witnesses, who were literally there only to be witnesses, said that they didn't actually witness the birth, really just to fan the flame of doubt. So Anne was suspicious, and now all she had to do was convince her sister. Mary actually drew up a questionnaire for Anne, 23 questions on the Queen's labour and circumstances, such as, was the Queen acting maternally to the baby? Were the curtains being drawn over the bed during the labour? Who exactly was in the room? Anne wrote back, she thought that the Queen was acting coldly to the child, not seeming to care too much for its cries, and she said she was suspicious of the baby coming so quickly, only two hours after the first signs of labour. The child also came much earlier than expected, almost a month before the expected due date. Anne even went as far to interview the Queen's dresser, who was present at the birth, and though her answers supported a normal and natural birth of a new prince, Anne was still not convinced. As well as Anne, the public was suspicious of this miracle birth, and it was the public who spread these rumours actively, spreading disbelief and legitimacy of this new heir. They printed pamphlets, cartoons, articles in the newspaper, describing exactly how this switch was possible. There were plenty of debates by how this happened exactly. Was this baby real but died in childbirth and switched for a live baby? Was the child faked the whole time and was this always planned and substituted for the real thing? No one really agreed on these details, but they all did agree that this child was not legitimate. There was also a published map, as seen here, to track whether it was possible to get easily and quickly through the Queen's bedchambers directly into the birthing bed without being noticed. Anne wrote to her sister, It may be it is our brother, but God only knows. Where one believes, a thousand do not. And most did not. It was estimated about two-thirds of the country believed the baby to be illegitimate, which isn't really great odds when you're trying to be the future king. Anne also reported that the child was quite sickly in its early years, and many often thought that the young prince would not live long. These sicknesses actually brought out new suspicion on the child, that the imposter himself had clearly died and yet again replaced with a new baby, or even again with a third imposter. Now, Mary found Anne's doubts convincing, and this allowed her ultimately clear conscience in making the right steps to secure England's crown for herself, and not an illegitimate Catholic imposter. Now, Mary had actually married her cousin, William Prince of Orange, and together with the noble and popular support, they launched what became known as the Glorious Revolution, essentially kicking her own father off the throne and forcing them to flee to France. 
they had actually been invited to rebel by a group of noble Protestants named the Immortal Seven on June 30th, just 20 days after the young prince's birth. So, England essentially revolted against the birth of one child who could potentially change the very future and religion of England all over again. And that's not the last we hear of him. Anyone heard of the Jacobite rebellions, the old pretender, the king across the water? James Francis Edward Stuart may or may not have been legitimate, and this was a rumour he could never run away from. Here is a painting dated in the early 1700s of a lady holding a warming pan, with James Stuart's reflection in the pan itself. Perhaps just a subtle hint of her thoughts on the matter. He literally was haunted by this incident through his entire life. An act of settlement was passed in 1701 that excluded Catholics definitively from the English throne, and there has actually yet to be another Catholic ruler in England. To prevent such a scandal in the future, a custom was created that a member of the government must always attend the birth to confirm its legitimacy, and this only ended in 1948. Though, I doubt that even that would have convinced Anne. To be honest, I can't even get over how many people used to want to be in the room with the Queen, giving birth. Times really have changed. Now, I think that the biggest question here isn't if you think that the baby was fake or smuggled in, but do you think that Anne really believed these tales, or do you think that she just wanted to believe them so badly and convince her sister to invade? really to get herself back in the line of succession. I'd love to hear your thoughts below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.